The Nigerian construction industry is in an excellent position at the moment. The forecast for the sector is continued growth for at least the next five years. And in 2020, it is predicted to become the fastest growing building industry in the world. My name is Peace Hyde, and this is My Worst Day on Forbes Africa TV. Currently, Nigeria builds approximately 100,000 homes annually, but in order to keep up with demand, particularly from its middle class of more than 23 million people, it will need to construct approximately 700,000 homes each year. Underpinning this industry is the raw materials needed to build. Today on My Worst Day, we meet the driving force in this sector. Let's take a look at who he is. Aliko Dangote, born the 10th of April 1957, is a Nigerian billionaire who owns the Dangote Group, which is a multinational conglomerate with interests in commodities. As of January 2015, Dangote had an estimated net worth of 18.6 billion US dollars, making him the richest man in Africa and the 67th richest person in the world, according to Forbes. The Dangote Group, whose core business focus is to provide local value-added products and services that meet the basic needs of the African population, has grown by leaps and bounds and has a presence in 18 African countries. The group, which currently has a market capitalization of over $24 billion, as at December 2013, has four of its 13 subsidiaries listed on the Nigerian Stock Exchange. One of the subsidiaries, Dangote Cement PLC, is the biggest listed company in West Africa and the first Nigerian company to join the Forbes Global 2000 companies. Thank you for joining us on My Worst Day on Forbes Africa TV. And today we have Africa's richest man, Mr. Aliko Dangote. You are most welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, so we'd like to start off by asking, who is Mr. Aliko Dangote? Well, obviously, um, as you know, yes, my name is Aliko Dangote. Uh, I was born in 57 april 10th in 57 um, went to uh, you know uh, after my education i started business in uh, lagos in 1978 and as of today i'm the ceo of dongote industries which is the holding company of uh, you know dongote group uh, which we operate in about 18 african countries uh, Sub-Saharan African countries and also going into Nepal, which is outside uh, Africa. Now that's phenomenal. You've built an amazing success story from a trader to becoming one of the greatest industrialists of our time. What has that journey been like for you? Well, the journey really, you know, the journey has actually been very, very excellent. It's been very uh, exciting, I can say, but uh, also was a little bit of challenge here and there. Um, you are right, we were actually a trading company. We traded uh, from 1978 up to uh, 1997 uh, you know, in proper sort of trading and trying bits and pieces. Uh, in 1989 though, you know, we tried to do textile, you know, and we built a big business in textile almost up to about six uh, up to about 6,400 uh, workers, of which we had to close down. But we have always been able to overcome the challenges, you know, because the way that we operate is that we think big and we roll out very big, you know, but it's been good so far. Is that a reflection of your personal um, approach to everything in life, that you always think the biggest, grandest vision? Yes, that's what I always, uh, you know, think. You know, because for you to make it really, you have to think big. You have to dream big to be able to be big. And, uh, you know, that's what I do. Phenomenal. Now, the Dan Gotti Group has actually diversified into a wide range of sectors, um, including now building the largest oil refinery. What is the rationale behind the diversification strategy? 
Well, you see, the, there was application structure. You know, at first, we're sort of like a trading company, as you said. We tried a couple of things, banking, uh, you know, frozen fish trading, uh, textile manufacturing. Uh, you know, so we tried a couple of things. We are now in 1997. We now focus on silk farm, just industry. Uh, right now, the diversification is good in business because there is nothing that is 100% uh, fully uh safe you know when i say fully safe which means you are not going to have challenges in business i mean it's like today we have different types of businesses and we have uh in we are in so many other different countries uh you know if five countries out of 18 for example maybe they are having challenges we'll still be able to remain afloat by doing what we're supposed to be, you know, uh, doing, moving on, not being stressed in any way. Uh, so the diversification is extremely very good, but also the diversification has to be monitored closely so that you just don't keep establishing different types of businesses. You know, with us, we only move into a business that we fully do understand, where at least 10 of our top guys, even if you wake them up from sleep, they can tell you exactly the process A to Z because the most dangerous thing for an entrepreneur to do uh, you know is actually you know to go into a business that he does not understand fully uh, you don't have to be an engineer or you don't have to be you know but you need to understand the business in and out so diversification is extremely very very good and you are also spreading out your risk you know i mean if i now go uh let's say before we're only in sugar refining for example and if we had remain only in sugar refining if sugar turns out to be bad then we've had it you know so the best way to do things is to diversify and uh, you've raised one issue saying yes we are now building the biggest you know refinery if you look at it right from the beginning our group made um an effort to make sure that we stay out of oil business you know because if you are you know lifting crude or you are you know um, uh, having oil blocks or something you know anything that you say oil people will tend it to be a corrupt area so we decided totally to remain out of oil and uh, even now that we are getting out uh, into oil we are getting into the downstream mainly downstream and then upstream we have already established a name and uh, there's nothing that will make us do things that will tarnish the uh, the uh, brand so and that's why now we're there and we've been pushed to oil actually because uh, we realized that we had so much cash it's too much cash for the type of businesses that we're running today right so we need to uh, diversify that's number one on diversification again we look at what are the areas that can actually take nigeria to the next level and that's why we map out all the issues and the problems that we're facing as a country for lack of diversifying the economy you know because when we're selling oil at 100 dollars we ought to have diversified the economy fully because the money wasn't for just paying salaries we should have used that money to diversify the economy into various things so that we don't end up as an importer nation. You know, they say that importer nations, what they normally do is that you import poverty and export jobs out. And that's what we try to do to make sure that uh, we make Nigeria great and Nigerians proud. I mean, it's understood worldwide that in terms of the continent, you are the benchmark of entrepreneurship. Um, but what drives you in business is is the goal to be the richest man in the world at some point no it's not uh, the goal to be uh, the richest man i've never really i'm not in competition with anybody that's right. number one so number two i think it is mainly to see how impactful we are going to be to uh, humanity Right. I think, uh, you know, you would like to be remembered for things that you have actually done, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why we are also very active in terms of philanthropy, you know, uh, it's not only about business, uh, but you know, we, my own thinking is that, or my own belief, really not thinking, my own belief is that uh, we Africans were the only ones that can make Africa great. 
because all the time you go to a lot of conferences ah you know opportunities in africa africa is great but see unless we lead nobody will follow us so we need to lead first then we'll have the foreign investors that will follow us where they will back us up with a lot of money they have more money than us but we will not be able to do it you know alone but they cannot also come and be the people who will start Well, I must ask, um, with such an amazing um, journey as an entrepreneur, what has been your worst day in business? Oh, my worst day in business. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know why you want me to remember the worst day of my business. But I mean, look, let me tell you, the worst one actually was when we first started with our cement business. Uh, business in the sense that uh, we want to build a cement factory. You know, we were importing before. We had an import terminal in Lagos and Katakot. But because of the government regulation and also government gave incentives to people who will make Nigeria self-sufficient in cement. So what we did was actually say, okay, fine, you know, let's go and build a plant. The entire production of Nigeria was just less than less than two million tons in 2003, November. But we decided that we we're going to go ahead and build five billion tons, you know, capacity. So we uh, brought in a contractor and asked the contractor to do the soil test. And eventually the same contractor, we gave them to now go and do the, uh, you know, uh, foundation job. Uh, but- And this was the creation of your first ever um, factory. Cement factory, yes. This is the first ever one you did. First. How old were you at the time? Uh, this was 2007. I was. Ah, okay. I was already 50 years old. Right. So, with that, they gave us a wrong soil test. You know, we gave them the contract to check the soil test and see whether it was going to be piling or whatever. You know, and normally in the northern, northern part of Nigeria, it's a very hard ground. So, but they came up with that. Yes, you know, we just need shallow foundation two meters maximum. So the drawings, everything was done based on two meters foundation. As soon as we started the uh, job, not more than three months into the project, then we realized that it was a wrong soil test. Now we had to go and do piling. So we had to stop. Okay, we had to stop and, uh, you know, change all the drawings all yes. over. And all of a sudden, we were faced with 1,000 piles to be built. And there were no enough rigs in Nigeria. We had to order rigs. We had to actually buy rigs for some of the contractors because, you know, it was a project that we already, when we started, you know, we were hiding away from the competition, not for them to even know what we were doing. So we didn't even commission anybody to do a proper feasibility study. study so what we did was just that we did an in-house calculation between us and FLS who sold us the machine and uh, you know obviously their interest was to sell their own uh, equipment. We came out with a cost of 480 million dollars and 480 million dollars was huge amount of money in 2003. It's still 2004. <laughs> uh, well in Nigeria at that time because majority 90 percent of our banks they only had capital of $20 million. And there was no long-term money. All the money we were borrowing was short-term money, 90 days. So you could see the challenge. The project actually stopped. We had to change the drawings. We couldn't borrow too much money in the system and the money was short-term money, 90 days. Borrowing short-term, you know, uh, investing in a long-term uh, business. And uh, at, you the, know, at the point where it ha everything stopped, what was going through your mind? What did you think? That if this project fails, that I'm gone. Really? Yeah, yeah. You know, it was really very challenging. But that's not even the challenge, uh, you know, yet. So I'm just taking through a small story. So we realized that we had to build a gas pipeline because the government uh, that promised to do the gas pipeline in 1978, they 
had actually not done anything. So we had to do 92 kilometers of gas pipeline. Water table was very bad in the area. We had to build a dam. Uh, there was nothing there. We had to build 480 houses. So the challenges were coming one by one. And because of the not really delay, delay we try as much as possible to shorten the uh, delay. So we run by uh, saying that, look, you know, what we did was that in my office here, I had the drawings all over. But what I had in my mind was that, look, once this project fails, the group is gone. So that was really what uh, that kept me all your going. Is gone well, we still could have survived, but you know, it was a major project for us because our size uh, compared to a project of half a billion then, you know, was big money for, for us. Uh, was but there a because point you thought you wouldn't recover from this? No, 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 we will recover, but it's going to take us a long time. Nobody wants to do a project and fail. But uh, uh, the most challenging was when we had the cost of our own. And after the cost of our own, now we finished the cement factory and we, you know, the factory was not working. So that was really when I went, you know, I mean, from black to red, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, my skin color changed, you know, I mean, because I knew that, yes, we are really in uh, trouble. But we are very, very adamant and we are, you know, we persevere and say that no, this will not happen to us. We will definitely get out of it. And we work hard throughout day and night. We had challenges of over maybe a year or so. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the factory was working on and off, issues here, issues there. But eventually we were able to overcome, especially, uh, luckily for us, a uh, consortium of banks was also, uh, you know, uh, IFC, International Finance Corporation, part of World Bank, uh, you know, uh, gave us a, a loan led by uh, them to the local banks. And we now put up another loan of $479 million. So that helped to also free some of the cash of the group. And uh, with the promise that, yes, we, you know, they said that we need seven years money two years moratorium, five years repayment, but we're able to actually, you know, we're able to pay the debt in 18 months, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. even before the expiry of the, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, two years moratorium period. So it was a challenging mm -hmm. project, which actually taught us a lot of lessons and also gave us the, uh, remove a lot of fear out of our minds that look, there's nothing that is impossible. That's why you see it on my desk over there. Yes, I noticed it when I came in. Um, during the challenging period, did you ever actually question yourself? Did you ever question yourself as an entrepreneur, as a businessman, whether you were even um, doing the right thing? Well, I knew I was doing the right thing, but you know, there are major challenges that really just came up. But uh, that is one area that I knew there is you no know, uh, tenacity and also focus in business is very key, it's very important, you know. I mean, uh, I've learned quite a lot. Since that time, you know, I don't really get scared of anything at all. So now you're fearless? Yes, I'm fearless, yes. Throughout that process, how much money did you actually lose? We did lose uh, money. Per se, um, but uh, we went through hell because uh, if you say money in terms of opportunity, how much we lost in terms of uh, you know uh, loss opportunity? Yes, maybe we you know we lost a couple of millions, but you know this was a project that we did, and to our greatest surprise, we were able to pay everybody off and put them. You know, I mean, pay them off their money in 18 months so uh it came out really very 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 well but you know uh during the trying times i can assure you you know at the time that i started i don't think if i even had gray hair but i developed most of my gray hair those uh, during those period of three and a half years of building vagina. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's a lot of young people that look up to you, that admire you, and you're an icon to them. Um, what would be your advice from coming through challenges upon challenges to hold 
the crown of Africa's richest man. What would be your advice to young entrepreneurs? I mean, well, one of my first advice to them is to be very focused and also understand what they really want to do and understand the business that they are going to go uh, into. They have to also persevere. They have to have, you know, they have to be uh, tough in, uh, you know, what they are going to do. But there's one mistake that I think we are doing mainly. It's not only a Nigerian, it's an African mistake, where people normally they spend their projected income. I advise entrepreneurs to make sure that they don't go on spending their projected income. They better let the money come in first before they start spending. Uh, social life and business, they don't actually go together. You have to be very, very serious, focused. If you want to enjoy life, then you'll not be able to work hard. I think it's always better. Make the money, then you can enjoy yourself. Excellent. Um, now, we've spoken so much about your side as a businessman, but we also know that you're a very, very big philanthropist. So could you talk to us about the philanthropy you do and the Dangote Foundation? Well, under the Dangote uh, Foundation, you know, we, you know, in 2014, we did, uh, it's, it's a foundation that we actually got, our, you know, registration in, uh, you know, 1994. You know, and uh, you know, we, we've been doing quite a lot of things since 1993. That's when I actually, you know, started. But uh, we had to go through registration and COBA. We got it, I think, in uh, April to 1994. So after the registration, you know, we are doing a lot of boreholes. We are doing feeding. Uh, as I, we speak today, we feed almost about 12,000 people every day. Um, in uh, 2014, you know, uh, when we clock almost about, uh, you know, 20 years or so, uh, I did an endowment, additional endowment of, uh, you know, 1.25 billion dollars, uh, then which was 200 billion naira at that time. And uh, what we are doing right now, we are focusing on mainly health, uh, education, empowerment, and then, you know, uh, disaster relief. Um, and I want to ask, what would you do if you woke up and you saw the Forbes witch list and you were no longer Africa's richest man? What impact do you think that would have on you? It didn't really have much impact on me, you know, because the issue today is not about who is the uh, you know richest or so. It's how impactful that you are to the society, and uh, you know I believe our own business is very strong. The fundamentals are there. I'm on a trajectory, and uh, you know I'll get to the top. It might be maybe three, it might be four years, it might be five years, but we have very good solid uh, foundation on all our businesses, and uh, you know. We will, we will lead, we will continue to lead in Africa. Excellent. Thank you so much Thank you. for your time, Mr. Lupa Dangotti. You've been Thank absolutely you. phenomenal. Thank you very much. Now we've heard from the magnate himself, but it's time to find out what his closest allies have to say about the continent's richest entrepreneur. I'm an engineer, Joe Makoju. My, uh, I work in the Dangote Group, um, honorary advisor to Alaji Aliko Dangote. My name is Allah Kone Alake. I'm the chief operating officer of Dangote Group and a group executive director. My name is uh, Knut Ulmum. I'm Norwegian. I'm uh, now the group executive director of Dangote Group. So I started here in uh, 1996 and uh, in the last 26 years I have worked close me with him. He's really a rare uh, person. He's uh, a man who has vision. He is a person that was always looking for what to do more. His business is tangential to the growth of Nigeria. Over these years we had a very close working relationship in uh, developing industrial growth in the country. In anything he puts his hands on, he strives you know, to, to hit the bar. If you go to Aliko Dangote, you must go with your facts, because he probably has more facts than you do. What drives him is positioning Nigeria 
as uh, the leading economy in uh, Africa. I think it was in 1997 that the group made the decision that if you don't add value in Nigeria, you don't do that type of business. Starting a business is tough, and it's even tougher when you're looking at creating a mark in the world. Every successful entrepreneur incurs problems, but for some of them, these problems provide the momentum to crafting solutions that pave the way to future success. How will you deal with your worst day? My name is Peace Hyde, and this is my worst day on Forbes Africa TV.